Hi, welcome to Biology 139. This is the first lab. It's fairly simple. Each of the labs start out with a list of the things we want you to know. Here's your list of things we want you to know. And then we actually show you page by page each of the things. And then at the end we have a summary. And then when it's time for our weekly quiz, we just go to the summary and we choose five to ten of the questions and ask them to you. So if you listen to these tapes and you learn these things in the checklist, you should easily make a hundred on the lab. It's very easy. First thing we're going to look at are the different types of formed elements, that's what they call them, or cells that are in your blood. So you have erythrocytes, which are your red blood cells, and then you have five different kinds of white blood cells. So here are your five different kinds of white blood cells. And we'd like for you to know what their function is. Why would you see an elevated neutrophil count? What would be the reason the eosinophils would increase? And anytime you get your blood drawn, they can do a variety of tests. Usually this is called a differential because normally they just tell you how many white blood cells you have and if they're elevated, then they go figure out which one of these is elevated. But if they do a differential, then they're going to tell you how many neutrophils you have, how many eosinophils you have, and, and basophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes. On the second page of your lab manual, you have examples of the six different types of cells. Now the erythrocytes are very easy to find in all of these cells because they don't have a nucleus. So a mature red blood cell has jettisoned, just kicked out its nucleus. And you can see where the nucleus used to be, but it isn't there anymore. So the erythrocytes are very easy to find. Now, normally, since white blood cells are white, they're hard to see whenever you're looking at a smear of blood. But these have been stained, so now we can see the different ones. The easiest one for me is the eosinophil because it's the one that stains red. So whenever you see a white blood cell that's stained red, and also if you look, it kind of looks granular. It looks like somebody glued sand on it or maybe uh, pink sugar. But anyway, that's the eosinophil. They usually go up if you have an infestation in your body of worms. Sometimes they go up if you're having an allergic reaction, but usually the ones that go up when you're having an allergic reaction is this one. These are basophils. And if you look, again, it looks like somebody's glued sand on this. So they call those granulocytes because they have little granules in them. And what those are are bags of histamine. So when you think about what goes on with an allergy and the, snuff, the stuffy nose, you know, making snot and everything, it's because you're releasing histamine and it causes fluid to come into the area. So this is one of the culprits. So if this is elevated, then you are almost certainly having some sort of an allergic reaction. This one is a polymorphonuclear leukocyte or PMN for short, or neutrophil. So you can tell this one because it has multi-lobed nucleus. Polymorpho means many shape, nuclear, so a many shape nucleus, and uh, leukocyte means a white blood cell, leukocyte. Don't get leukocyte confused with lymphocyte. So this one is a lymphocyte, and lymphocytes are very easy to confuse with monocytes. Now this is, these are very distinctly different. This looks like a telephone receiver, and this looks like a blob filling up almost the entire uh, cell. But if you look carefully, look at the size of the uh, red blood cells, the erythrocytes. And then look at the size of this. Now look at the size of the red blood cells and look at the size of this. The monocyte is going to be much, much larger. It's the largest. 
So all the rest of these are, are fairly close to size to the erythrocytes. This one's rather uh, like more than double. But this one is way more than double. This is huge, comparatively speaking. When I talk about the monocytes, I am always reminded of the TV show where this mild-mannered guy turns into the Hulk. And so here's the mild-mannered guy version of the monocyte. But once it encounters something that it feels that it needs to destroy, could be cancer cell, uh, it could be you just stuck a thorn in your finger. But if it finds something that it knows doesn't belong in your body, it will swell up, become much larger, and change its characteristics, and then it will be called a macrophage. And it will crawl around, and it will try and eat whatever it is that is the foreign substance in your body. At this point, I would suggest that you pause the video and open up your web browser and just type in eosinophil and look at the images of eosinophils and then type in lymphocyte, leukocyte, monocyte and see what pictures come up. These will be the pictures that we'll use on your quiz but it helps to know what these things look like Underneath the pictures, you have a little table. And again, it's a good idea to stop the video now and fill out this table. So what, what are the identifying characteristics of an erythrocyte? Well, it doesn't have a nucleus. That would be a big one. They're all red, even without being stained because they're full of hemoglobin. So that would be some of the characteristics that you see. They're not joined to each other. They're floating around in plasma. And what is the job? What is the function of a, a red blood cell, an erythrocyte? Well, the, one of the main things they do, obviously, is carry oxygen for us. The neutrophil is the polymorphonuclear leukocyte, and it's the one usually first on the scene whenever you're sick. So it could be bacteria, virus, fungus, whatever. When you very first get sick, these things are elevated. So they are uh, present in acute situations. Acute means it just started. They have the ability to eat the foreign invaders, bacteria, viruses, but they usually only last about three days and then they die fighting the good fight. Basophils stain purple or blue, and all those granules that you see in there are full of histamine. So you're going to see these in the case of an allergic reaction. It could be hay fever. It could be that you ate uh, strawberries and you're allergic to them. And then the eosinophils are the ones that have also granules in them. But these stain red, and the name of the, the stain that stains red as eosin, so they name them red loving or red dye loving. And this one is a basic dye loving right there. Oh, what do you think? Neutro, if you're neutral. So that kind of gives you a hint about what's going on, how they came up with their names. And this is the one usually if you have worms, worms, but it can also be slightly elevated if you have an allergic reaction to something. Now lymphocytes are the ones, these are the guys that hang on and in this time of COVID when they're talking about antibodies and they're talking about um, you know positive and negative tests for COVID and things like that, they're looking to see what the lymphocytes are up to because we have, when you do the immune system, you talk about the whole immune cascade and you have helper T cells, you have killer T cells, you have uh, suppressor T cells, you have uh, beta cells, 
that are going to be plasma cells. So you have different kinds of lymphocytes. So you talk about them more when you get into the immune system. But these are the guys that, that die out when you have AIDS, allowing you to die of pneumonia or die of cancer or something like that. So lymphocytes are the ones that are responsible for your immune system that makes antibodies. And monocytes, again, these are the ones that I was talking about. They're like the, the Hulk. So you're going to see them in the bloodstream at fairly low levels. But if you need them, they will grow larger and you will make more of them. And then we will call them macrophages. And they can grow large enough to eat cells. The next thing we expect you to know is blood typing. So if we were having lab in person, we have some uh, fake blood and we would do different little tests with the fake blood and see which one's agglutinate. So agglutinate means clump. And you're like, okay, that still didn't help me. I don't know what the heck you're talking about. Well, poke yourself and start bleeding. All right, everybody do that in your mind? All right, now watch what happens. It kind of coagulates. It kind of like draws together in a wad, a little sticky wad, and some fluid starts leaking out around it. And that wad we call a blood clot. So when they talk about agglutination, they're just talking about blood clotting. If you remember back to when we were learning about cells, and we talked about the phospholipid bilayer, and we talked about the fluid mosaic model of the cell. And we said that in this phospholipid bilayer, we have proteins floating around in it. And you can actually see them under the microscope, not the ones we have in our lab, but under electron microscopes. You can actually see them. And they move in and out and through the phospholipid bilayer. Now, when they started trying to give blood transfusions, sometimes it worked, but most often the person would die and die quickly, like within minutes of getting a blood transfusion. So they started looking on the cells to see which proteins might be causing the blood to clot and kill the person. And they found that some people have a protein and they very cleverly named it A and other people have a different protein, and they called it B. Some people have both proteins. They have both the A protein and the B protein. And then there are those who don't have the A or the B, and so they say they're O. So those are your four blood types, depending on which proteins you have sticking up. Now, they're not just plain proteins. They've got some lipid components and um, sugar components, but I'm just going to call them proteins. So, the people with A proteins have type A blood. The people with type B proteins have type B blood. If you have both A and B, you're type AB blood. And if you don't have any of those two proteins, then you're type O. All right? So far, so good. Now, if you give somebody who has type A blood from somebody who has type O blood, excuse me, type B blood, then they're going to attack the B blood because their body only understands, recognizes A. Any B coming in is going to be considered a foreign invader, and they've got to attack it. And so that's why the person ends up dying. So a person who has type A blood needs a type A blood transfusion. So you're going to match the blood type. If you have type B blood, so you've got the B proteins on your cells, not just your red blood cells, but all your cells, then you're going to have to make sure that you get B type blood. Don't get A, because that won't work for you. Okay, so far so good. Now, 
The reason for this, remember we talked about lymphocytes back there and we talked about antibodies? Well, you have antibodies against things that aren't you. Now, hopefully you don't make antibodies against things that are you because then that means you have an autoimmune disease. And so that never works out very well when you attack your own body. So rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, these are things that you have where you attack your own body. But we're just talking about blood typing here. So if you have type A blood, you're going to have antibodies against B. If you have B blood, you're going to have antibodies against A. If you have AB blood, you cannot have antibodies against A, nor can you have antibodies against B, because then you'd attack your own cells. So you don't have antibodies against either one. So a lot of times they talk about people who are AB blood being the universal recipient, because they can have a transfusion of A blood, and they won't attack it. They can have a, a transfusion of B blood. They won't attack it. And they could have a transfusion of AB blood, and they won't attack it. Now remember, O blood doesn't have A or B, so you can give O blood to anybody because it doesn't have A's and it doesn't have B's, so there's nothing for the antibodies to attach onto and cause the cells to uh, be destroyed. So O is considered to be the universal donor, because they can give their blood to anybody. Well, that all worked well and good, except every now and then, you'd give somebody who had type A blood a, a type A blood transfusion, and they'd die anyway. So they said, okay, there's got to be something we're missing. So there's something more than just this AB business going on here. So they got to looking around. Well, there was some guy that was looking at rhesus monkeys, and he was looking to see how closely related we were. How many genes did we have in common? How many proteins did we have in common? Stuff like that. And he ran across what he, they, we now call the rhesus monkey factor. And about roughly 98% of people have it. Have it. But... Sorry, I misspoke there. We are about 97 to 98% same genes as a rhesus monkey. But back to the RH factor, about anywhere from 7 to 15% of the population is missing the rhesus monkey protein or the rhesus monkey factor. So we call those people RH negative. Rh for rhesus monkey negative, meaning they're missing that protein. And I gave the range from 7 to 15 percent of the people are Rh negative. Oddly enough, we tend to want to look at America because we look, live in America, and in America it's about 15 percent Rh negative, but worldwide it's only about 7 percent. So we're a little bit odd there. Also, if you just look at the statistics of it, the O, if you do genetics, and we will actually will look at blood types when we do genetics, O should be the rarest. But in America, it's one of the most common. So we are selectively breeding or having babies to uh, have more Rh negative and to have more people with O type blood than is normal or that would be expected through genetics. So, Americans, we do our own thing. Now, if you're one of the few people have, who has Rh negative blood, since you don't have that protein, since you are Rh negative, then you can make antibodies against the Rh factor. So that was the thing that they have to check for. So when you go in and have your blood taken, and they blood type it, they're going to say, oh, you're O positive, or you're A negative. And so they're telling you what your blood type is, as well as whether you have or don't have the rhesus monkey factor. Besides getting a blood transfusion and getting the RH factor 
when you're RH negative. Another time that you can have a problem with your RH factor is if you get pregnant. So if a lady is RH negative and her husband is RH positive or her baby daddy is RH positive, then the baby can be RH positive and the mother could, if she had any access to the baby's blood, she could actually attack the baby because the baby has foreign Usually the only time that you would be in danger is when you're actually giving birth. So the baby is inside the placenta and you're uh, fairly safe. But once you give birth, then you tear the placenta and the baby comes out and the mother can get sensitized to the baby and have antibodies against the Rh positive. So to prevent that, they have a Rogam shot. And now this is kind of cool because it's antibodies against the antibodies. So if the mother makes the antibodies, then the Rogam shot binds to them and keeps the mother from making antibodies and thus killing the baby. I suggest you pause the video at this point in time and see if you can figure out who can donate blood to whom? For example, if I was O negative, who could I give blood to? I'm O negative. So I should be able to give to anybody, whether they're A, B, A and B, AB positive, AB negative, because O means I don't have the A or B, so they're not going to cause those people to attack my blood and I don't have the rhesus monkey factor so there's nothing there to make antibodies against so O negative is one of the most valuable bloods because it can be given to anybody O negative AB positive is the easiest to give blood to because they can take anybody's blood it doesn't matter if it's positive or if it's negative because they can't make antibodies against it because they're positive and they can't make antibodies against B because they have B, and they can't make antibodies against A because they have A. So they can take anybody's blood. So those are the easy ones, O neg and AB positive. But how about somebody who is B negative? Can they take blood from somebody who's B positive? No. If they're B positive. Can they have B negative blood? Yes. The next thing we want you to know is what is a normal white blood cell count and what is a normal red blood cell count? So in the 40 some odd years that I have been teaching classes like this, used to, we would take a little sample of the patient's blood and put it on a slide. We had special slides with grids and we would count how many red blood cells there were and how many white blood cells there were. And nowadays we just have a machine, we put a drop of blood in and the machine does it for us. So it's much more, uh, much quicker <laughs> than it was back in my day. So to give you an idea of, of what a um, cubic millimeter is, that's mm with a three, is a cubic millimeter. If you took a teaspoon and you divided it up into about 5,000 parts, this would be one five thousandths of a teaspoon. So it's a very, very, very tiny drop. So if you were looking at that very tiny drop, you would expect to find at least five white blood cells in that drop and anywhere up to 10,000. Now, if you have over 10,000, then you've either got worms, you're coming down with the flu or COVID, or you have an allergic reaction going on. Something is, some infection of some sort is causing your white blood cells to rise. So if you're within this range, anywhere from five to 10,000 per cubic millimeter, you're okay. Over that, they need to find out which of your white blood cells is elevated, and then they can, they can figure out what to treat you for. So like if you've got worms, uh, they have medicines like ivermectin that treat you for parasites and like worms. If it is um, 
a virus, then it won't do you any good to give the person the antibiotic because antibiotics work against bacteria and not against viruses. And now we have some antiviral medicines that they've come up with, like Tamiflu, and then the new ones that they're coming out with that work against uh, the different types of COVID. So knowing what kind of white blood cells are elevated and then figuring out whether it's a virus, a parasite, a fungus, then that'll help you uh, determine what treatment the person needs. Now I find it interesting that they put the red blood cell count of males, how many million red blood cells should they have per cubic millimeter, uh, and they didn't put female. So females have fewer red blood cells than males do. So if you draw our blood and look at it uh, and do what they call hematocrit on it, ours should be much lower. So our hematocrit would be like between 37 and 42. And a guy's can be anywhere from 45 to 52% red blood cells. So... You've probably noticed whenever they draw blood, they put it in a tube, and then they can take the tube and spin it down, and they look and see what percentage of the tube is made up of red blood cells and what percentage of the tube is made up of the fluid, the plasma. So in the case of, of a male, it, it would be about 50-50, but ladies don't make as much red blood cells. We don't make as many. So ours would be like... Uh, closer to 42 or 40 to 60 fluid. If I ever say something that doesn't make sense to you, stop the video right there and go look and see what it is I'm talking about. Because with the uh, different kinds of browsers we've got and all the information that's out there, you can easily go look and see and I find a picture or a short explanation of whatever I'm talking about. Or if you're really confused, you can just text me and I'll explain it to you. But here's an example of a hematocrit right here. Here's the red blood cells. And there's the plasma right there. And here's the white blood cells. You don't have as many white blood cells. Now, this person clearly has way too much plasma, not nearly enough red blood cells. So we would say this person is anemic, or they have anemia. So they're not making enough red blood cells. So that's no good. And then this person has polycythemia, where they have too many red blood cells, right there, and not nearly enough plasma. Now this is a heart attack or a stroke waiting to happen. So this is not healthy right here. And um, some athletes have found that uh, if they do blood doping, they'll actually draw their blood or have somebody draw their blood. And then right before a co competition, they'll put the blood back in so they can carry more oxygen. They'll have more stamina. But the problem is they're going to end up with too many red blood cells. So it's a dangerous situation. So blood doping, you want to be careful about that one. In fact, I believe they're trying to make it illegal if it's not already illegal. And when I was talking about blood type and agglutination, if we were having labs in person, you, you would be able to see this. So here's somebody, and they put three drops of blood. These three drops of O blood, right here and here and here, have antibodies against A put on it, and nothing happens because there aren't any A proteins, so there's nothing for the anti-A antibodies to stick on to. Same thing with B. There's no B proteins on O-type blood, so there's nothing for the antibodies to stick on to. So the blood just remains a puddle of blood. But in the case of AB blood, if you put anti-A, it's going to cause it to clot. So all the red blood cells, instead of being spread out like this, will be clumped up or agglutinated. And if you put anti-B antibodies, 
because there are B proteins on AB blood, it's going to clump. So look at this and see if you can figure out what's going on. Why does B type blood not clump when you put anti A on it? Well, because you don't have any A proteins. So there's nothing for the antibodies to stick on to. But there are B proteins. And you have some vocabulary words you need to learn. Leukocytosis, here's a picture right here. So anytime you come across something like that, again, go out and look on the you know, internet like I'm doing. And here is clearly a lot of white blood cells. Way more than you normally would see. And look at that one. Do you see all the granulocytes right there? So here's your polymorphonuclear leukocytes. And then there's one of your granulocytes. And since this has been stained pink, it's kind of hard to tell whether that one is an eosinophil or a basophil. But it's definitely one of the granulocytes. So leukocytosis, too many white blood cells because you've got an infection going on somewhere. Leukopenia, penia means not enough. So in this case, you don't have enough white blood cells. Polycythemia, we looked at a hematocrit that showed way too many red blood cells. So way too many red blood cells. And then anemia is not enough red blood cells. In class, I would give you four different samples, and you don't know what their blood types are. And then we would have anti-A antibodies, anti-B antibodies, and anti-RH. And then you should be able to tell what the blood type is of Mr. Smith, Ms. Jones, Mr. Green, and Ms. Brown. So I hate that we, we are missing that part of the class due to COVID. So you can play the what if game. What if Mr. Smith was type A blood? When you put the anti-A serum on it, it's going to clot. It's going to agglutinate. If you put the anti-B serum on it, nothing's going to happen. Now, if you put the anti-RH serum on it and it clots, what does that mean? Well, it means that Mr. Smith is A because that clotted, and he does have the RH factor because that clotted. So we would say his blood type was A positive. And then they want to know which antigens are present. So an antigen is something that an antibody can stick to. So he has A antigens, and he has RH antigens. Now, what antibodies does he have present? Well, he's going to have B antibodies. You're like, what? Well, he can't have A antibodies because he'd attack his own blood. And he can't have RH antibodies because he'd attack his own blood. So go through and fill this out and pretend that Mr. Smith has type A and Miss Jones has B, and Mr. Green has AB, and Miss Brown has O. And then go through and think, okay, what would happen if I put anti-A serum on type B blood? Well, nothing would happen. What would happen if I put anti-B on type B blood? Well, it would clot. And then if I put the anti-RH serum on it and it did not clot, then I would say, oh, okay, Miss Jones is B negative. B negative. So play around with it and fill it out. And now we get into the memorization part of uh, the lab. The lab tends to do more anatomy stuff 
So you do more of the identification of bones and the identification of blood vessels and things. And in the lecture part, you learn how the bones move, how they articulate, how the muscles work, how the blood goes through, what kind of sensors that you have in your arteries that let you know if you have high blood pressure or if you're falling, things like that. So you have a lot more memorization in lab. And here's a list of the things that you need to be able to identify in a pig. Now this looks like a lot of stuff here, but let's stop and just break it down a little bit because you guys already had Biology 137. So you know where your femur is, and you know that a pig's leg would be, it would have a femur in it also. So the artery is going to be somewhere near the femur. The pulmonary trunk, we learned that when we learned the heart, but it comes off and goes off between the heart and the lungs. Pulmonary means lungs. So you go somewhere near the lungs and look for that one. The umbilical cord, not so obvious in a pig as it is in a human, but we'll look and we'll find, you know approximately where the umbilical cord is because that's where your belly button is. Renal is your kidneys. The aorta, again, when we learn the heart, we're going to learn about the aorta and the pulmonary um, arteries and veins. So we'll do that with the heart. Uh, coming out of the heart is the aorta, and then it comes up, makes an arch, and then runs down the abdomen. So you guys all know where your abdomen is, so you should be able to find. And the aorta is the largest artery, so that should kind of give it away too when you see this great big thing coming out of the heart and then going along and uh, going back down back towards the uh, vertebra. Brachiocephalic, all right, so wherever this thing is, it's gonna go down into the arm and up into the head. So if you see something branching off, going down to the arm and up in the head, you probably found the brachiocephalic. The carotids, those are the ones in your neck. And if you watch any kind of murder mysteries or something, people are always getting their carotid artery cut and then they bleed out really fast. And then we learned about the clavicle. We learned about the scapula and the clavicle. Those are the, the ones, the clavicle runs across and attaches to your sternum, the top of your sternum, the manubrium part. And so wherever this particular artery is, it's going to be running under the clavicle, subclavian. And then you're going to have one on the left side and one on the right side because you have a left clavicle and a right clavicle. So while this looks uh, intimidating, just look at the name of it and you pretty much know exactly where it is so you know where to go looking for it. And then the veins. Now in the pig, what they've done is they've, they've taken the, the pig. So when they slaughter pigs, you know, to make hams and bacon and things for us, um, they can take the babies out before they're born, and they sell those as fetal pigs. So they've never they've never been um, they've never been born. They're fetal. So what they do is they draw out the blood, and then they replace the blood in the arteries with red latex and let it harden. And then the veins they put blue latex. So anytime you see blue then you know that that's a vein, and when you see red, you know it's an artery. And so here we have the left and right renal artery and the left and right renal vein. So the way you could tell the two apart is because this one's going to have red rubber in it, and this is going to have blue rubber in it. And then you have the superior anterior vena cava and the inferior posterior vena cava. And oop, there's a brachiocephalic again. Now, when we're looking at the carotids over here, we're also going to be looking for jugulars right there. So you have an external set of jugulars and an internal set of jugulars. And then they want you to find the spleen. 
also because oddly enough the spleen is sometimes added in and, and counted as part of the blood system it helps to look at a picture of the human heart and look at the pulmonary trunk so here is the heart right there and branching off from the right ventricle is the trunk and then it goes off to the various uh, right and left lung. So it conveys the blood that needs oxygen over to the lungs. And then once it's gone past the lungs, then it comes back as oxygenated blood. And the left ventricle is going to push the oxygenated blood out and through the aorta some of it going up to the brain, some of it coming down and going down into the um, upper trunk of your body. I find that when I'm trying to memorize stuff, it helps to have like an anchor point. So in this case, the anchor point would be the heart. So here's your heart right there. And if you're looking at this pig, this is the right side of the pig. And this is the left side of the pig. So since it's laying on its back, it's opposite of what you would be thinking. So be careful right there. So the right side is over here, and the left side is over here. And here's the heart. And coming out of the right ventricle, right there, is the pulmonary trunk. And we know it's going to branch off, and one part of it is going to go off to the right lung. And one of them is going to go off to the left lung. And then the aortic arch is right there. There's the aortic arch. And you see all the branchings that come off of it. So as it branches off, there's a brachiocephalic branching off of the aorta. Here's your left subclavian. So this is going to go under, uh, beneath the clavicle, coming up. And then you notice it's kind of like, uh, I don't know uh, how familiar you guys are with Lexington, but you're driving along on a road, and it's Harrodsburg Road. And all of a sudden, you go across an intersection, and it's suddenly Broadway. You're like, wait a minute. I mean, I was just on Harrodsburg Road. Now I'm on Broadway. So as you're going along, and this is the brachiocephalic, then it's going to branch off, and it's going to become the right subclavian, and then this is going to come off and become the right and the left common carotid. So as it passes intersections, it changes its name. So don't let that confuse you. So you can stop the video right now and just sit and look at this. Okay, how can you remember the left subclavian? First of all, how can you remember that this is the left side of the pig? How can you remember that that's the right side of the pig? How can you tell the difference between the pulmonary trunk, which is this thing right there, and the aortic arch, which is this thing right here? So spend, spend a little time thinking about that and then looking at the intersections, the left subclavian, the right subclavian, the carotids. Carotid should be fairly easy because here's the neck of the pig and there's this carotid. And they're pink or red, so you know that they're arteries. And these are the lower arteries in the pig. Here's the uh, small intestines. And they pull them over to the side. And unfortunately, they've taken the umbilical region right here, which would be up here somewhere and pulled it down here so that you can see the left and the right umbilical arteries so this is not where it is <laughs> down here it would be up here but because they've cut this open and they pull the skin back so that you can look inside and pull the skin back and taken the intestines which would have been here and pull them over to the side it's a little bit uh, confusing when you're looking at this. So you need, in your mind, to pull the intestines back in here, and you need to take the 
umbilical region or the belly button and put it back up here. But anyway, it is what it is, and this is the picture that we need to, to learn. So there's the umbilical region or the belly button of the pig, and then there's the left and the right umbilical. And then here's the branching that comes off. So there's the abdominal aorta. So back when we were looking at the heart up here, we saw this arch with the branches that come off. So there's the aortic arch and branching off. And it's going to go back behind along the vertebra. And we're going to see it coming out here, right there. So there's the ab abdominal aorta. And look how much larger it is than the other arteries. You know, the femoral artery has got to be pretty big because the femur is the, the largest bone and you've got a lot of muscle there that's supporting your body, so you need a lot of blood. So, But, but compared to the abdominal uh, aorta, look at the difference in size. All right, so there's your femoral. And what else do we need to know? Renal. All right, your kidneys. If you could put your hands on your hips and put your thumbs up, then you're going to be in the, the region of your kidneys. They're kind of around back and just slightly above your waist. So here's the pig's, kind of hard to find where the pig's waist is, right there, uh, especially since they've moved his belly button down here and moved his intestines up there. But anyway, the, the renal artery is going to be coming off of the kidney. So there's one kidney, and they haven't cleaned this off, so we can't see the other kidney. So if you can figure out that that's the kidney, and you see an artery coming off of it, you go, well, that's got to be the renal, the renal artery coming off. Here's a picture of another pig, and you can see, now these are blue. So you know whatever these are, that they've got to be veins and not arteries. So looking at this, here is your left external jugular, and there's your left internal jugular. So this would be your right external jugular and your right internal jugular. There. And again, here's your anchor point. Use your heart for the anchor point. There it is. There's the ventricles of the heart and then the atria. And the superior vena cava is the largest vein, and it drains down into the heart. So this one, superior vena cava, and here's the inferior vena cava, and vena vein, so it's going to be blue. Now this is a nice dissection where they, you can easily see the kidney right there. So there's the waist of the pig. There's his liver. There's his intestines pulled over there. Here's the umbilical region right there with the umbilical arteries. And you can see the vein coming off the kidney. Um, I thought it was interesting that they wanted you to know where the spleen was in the picture, but I had to go and find a different picture to show you where the spleen is. So it's this little thing right here, right there. And this thing is your the pig's stomach, right there. So the spleen's going to be near the stomach. And then the pancreas is always below the stomach where it joins with the intestines. And when we do the digestive system, you'll find out why the pancreas is located there. And then your large intestines and your small intestines. So I would pause the video and I would go back, now that you've looked at the two pictures of the pig, and see, now where would I look for the aorta? What color will it be if it's an artery? How about the renal? Can I tell the left? versus the right of the pig. How can I tell that? 
How can I find the femoral artery? So now that you've looked at it, make sure that we looked at all of these different ones and you can identify them. And this is a list of the blood vessels, the arteries that they want you to know in the uh, human model. So vertebra, you guys know where the vertebra is. We know where the carotid is in the pig. So we know where the carotid is pretty much in humans. The aortic arch in the aorta, subclavian below the clavicle, axillary, you guys remember from first semester, axillary is under your arm, it's your armpit, and brachial is running down your upper arm, ulna and radius, those are the two bones, and you remember that the radius is going to be coming up from your thumb, so the radial artery will be the one coming up from your thumb on that side of your wrist and the ulnar will be closer to your little finger so hopefully if you remember where the bones are you should be able to you know figure out where the arteries are uh, dorsal metacarpal arteries pulmonary trunk the abdominal aorta the one that arches over the heart and then runs back behind close to the vertebra renal artery going to be near the kidneys and then you remember the iliac the ilium the ischium and the pubis the three sets of bones that make up the pelvic girdle so the iliac is the one where you put your hands on your hip when you're mad so that's your iliac region so you have the common iliac the external and the internal femoral popliteal, anterior tibial. Remember where your tibia is and your fibula are. And then the dorsalis pedis. So here's the model of the man uh, or woman, hard to tell. And you should be able to so start with the heart. I always start with the heart and go off from that and you find out okay is this the left side of the guy or the right side of the guy well looks like they're facing us and if that's true then this should be the right side and this should be the left side okay all right and see if you can see what's branching off and going where this one is blue. It looks gray. This is blue. So you know this is probably the superior vena cava. This one is red and it branches off. So you know that that's probably the aorta and the aortic arch. And if you follow it down, 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 then that would be the abdominal aorta. So follow it along and see if you can use your textbook, use Google, and figure out if you can find where all of these are. The ulnar and the radial, let's see if we can find those. Okay, coming, here's the thumb, and there's the wrist. So the, the uh, radial artery, let's see, we'll do it on this other side. There you go. The radial artery would be on that side, and the ulnar would be on the other side. You don't see it as well here. Interestingly. Now we know this is the femur, but look at these various arteries. So which one is the femoral artery? And how can we tell which of these it is? Here's another picture I found for you. So here's the heart, and there is the abdominal aorta, and it branches off to become the external iliac arteries. Right there, external iliac arteries. And they go on down and branch off and become the femoral artery. So here's your another picture. So here you branch off from the abdominal aorta and you do the iliac external iliac and there you go now we have the femoral 
The top of the foot is known as the dorsal region, and pedis means foot, so it would make sense that the dorsalis pedis would be in the foot, right there. But notice this, when it's here, is known as the anterior tibial artery. And then once it get down, gets down into the foot region, so here's an intersection. Anytime you pass an intersection, it seems like they rename stuff. So just remember the dorsalis is the top of the foot, and it's going to come out towards the big toe right there. I would print out a copy of these blood vessels and then I would sit down with this picture and I would make sure that I could name each one of the arteries. Here's your kidneys. So you know that the artery coming off the kidneys has to be the renal artery. On TV, you always notice that they cut somebody's throat and they bleed out. So you don't really think about veins being uh, large enough to bleed out. Usually, if you hit an artery, you know the person's going to bleed out really quickly because the heart is pumping blood, and you can see it actually spurting out of the artery wherever you cut them. But if you cut the jugular, you're also most likely going to die. It's really hard to get you to the medical care before you bleed out with the jugular. So superior vena cava, you remember the veins are going to be blue in the pictures as opposed to the arteries. And uh, cephalic, you know that that has to do with the head. So go looking up into the head to find that particular one. Axillary is going to be under the arm. It's going to be in the armpit region. Subclavian is going to go underneath the clavicle. Let's see. Oh, superficial palmar arch. This one pretty much tells you what it is in its name. So superficial is going to be closest to the skin. It's in your palm. You know where the palm of your hand is. And it makes an arch. All right, so here's your basalic vein and your cephalic vein right there. Again, orient yourself with the thumb and the little finger. That's going to help you with those. And here you see the cephalic vein coming down even further and the basalic vein coming down further. Branching off, branching off, being renamed the median cubital vein. And coming on down and being renamed the ulnar vein. And the cephalic over here, coming down, coming down. Whoops. And it becomes a radial vein. I misspoke right here. There's the median Median's in the middle. Oop, median, there's a median, there's a median. Sorry. The basalic comes down and is renamed ulnar. My bad. My bad. So in this lab, we're learning about the name of the veins and the names of the arteries. But I'm giving you a foreshadowing. When we do the heart, notice the direction of the arrows of the blood flow. They're going up. So here's your right common iliac, your left common iliac. And they're actually flowing upwards. And the inferior vena cava flows upwards. Upwards. And it's bringing the blood back to the heart. So it can go through the pulmonary trunk and be reoxygenated. So that's kind of interesting. Because you just think, well, this is a tube. It's going to be running down because that's what gravity does. But it isn't. And then, of course, uh, there's your left renal and your right renal. 
And the saphenous vein is one of the longest veins in the entire body. So it's bringing blood back from the foot all the way up. So look at this and go, now wait a minute, <clears throat> was the cephalic on the side with the thumb or was it on the side with the little finger? And the basalic, oh, it's the other one. Uh, brachial, okay, that's upper arm, axillary is underarm. So go through these and think about them. Think about where they are, why they're important. And after you've tried naming them all yourself, here's the answer key right underneath it. So here you have where you can label it yourself and say, okay, Let's see, here's my, here's my heart. Which way am I going? There's the abdominal. And then go down here and check yourself out. Yep, there's the aorta, the aortic arch. Uh, there's the abdominal, yes. Ulnar should be coming down to the little finger, and the radial should be coming down to the thumb. Which it is on this one. I think that they've labeled these incorrectly. Because the ulnar always comes down to the little finger, and the radial always comes down to the thumb. Oops. This one's going to be easy. At the top of your foot. It tells you it's on the top of your foot. This one says it goes along your tibial region. Right there. There's the great saphenous. And you know it because it goes the whole way. And it's not red, so you know it's a vein. And then the small one. When you have a quiz over this stuff, you're going to have to be able to identify these various things on the different models. So this model, or that model, or in this case, we're looking at the neck model. So you know where your trachea is and the thyroid gland. Here's the thyroid. Here's the trachea right there. Now this is nice because they're labeled. So you can see number 12 is the trachea. And you come down here and you see the number 12 and there's the trachea. And you go up and see 13 is the thyroid. And you come down here and you see 13 is the thyroid. But hopefully you remember that from last semester still. So there are other things on there. For example, the larynx is number 10, but that's not one of the things that you need to know. So just make sure that you can find the, um, the left and the right common carotid arteries and jugular veins in the neck model as well as in these models. It's always nice to have case studies because it makes you think, if I see a patient and this is what's happening, what's going on? So there's some things you can figure out. For example, here is a hypothetical student in an accident and they cut their arm and their neck. So maybe they went through the windshield because they weren't wearing a seatbelt, who knows. And a state trooper noticed that they had pulsatile bleeding from a wound on the left arm. Okay, anytime it's coming out in a pulse, then you've hit an artery. And if it's a steady flow, then you've got a vein. So we know that they cut some vein in the neck and they are bleeding from an artery in their left arm. Now, there's more than one artery in the left arm. So it says, what is the damaged artery? So we maybe not know the name of it, but we know that it's an artery. And we know that the one in the neck is a vein. So which would be more serious? Well, you can bleed out from an artery usually faster, but what if it was a jugular? You can bleed out very quickly from the jugular vein. So that's it for lab one. 
So you've got your work cut out for you, memorizing those arteries and those veins, and memorizing some of the words like anemia, polycythemia, leukopenia, and leukocytosis. So good luck, and practice spelling and writing those veins and arteries.